good evening, everybody. On this inauguration week, we give God praise for how God has blessed us in so many ways. I don't know if you were able to watch the inauguration, but I tell you, it was a beautiful sight. Uh, it was full of color and diversity and inclusion and hope and a wonderful way to turn the page, hallelujah, on what has been a very trying and difficult and painful four years under the last administration. So we wanna begin by saying congratulations to our new president, Joseph Biden, and our new fabulous vice president, Kamala Harris. Uh, so tonight we're going to continue to uh, work through our uh, Bible study on the gospel according to Mark. I hope you have your Bibles ready. I hope you have your pen and your paper or your notebook, your iPad, whatever you use to take notes because I have a lot of good information for you tonight. Uh, as we continue to work through this uh, particular gospel. Before we start, you know what I want you to do? I want you to hit like, hit share, invite somebody else to join in with us so that they too can get involved in this opportunity to learn and to grow in the study of God's word. So it's not too late. Invite your friends, invite your family, um, hit record on your on your phone or on your uh, device so that maybe you can watch this later or share it with somebody else who may not be with us on Facebook. This is also going to be aired or this is also airing live on YouTube. So if you have friends or family who are not Facebookers, uh, direct them to the YouTube channel so that they too can participate and learn with us as we walk with Jesus through the gospel according to Mark. So let's get started. We're gonna open up with prayer and then we're going to get started by diving into the word of God. Let's pray together. Uh, God, we thank you for this day, for this week, uh, for an opportunity to exhale, uh, for hope, uh, for the opportunity to work toward uh, accountability, and justice, and hopefully, Lord, someday reconciliation uh, and peace, not just in this country, but in this world. But God, right now, um, we want to pay attention to what you are saying to us uh, through the Spirit as we study your word together. So while we are concerned with what goes on in the world, Father, right now, what we want is to be able to understand the world through the lens of our faith, and we're going to do that by studying your word together. So, Father, we ask that you open our minds uh, to understand, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to receive what you have to say to us on this evening. We ask this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 All right. Let's dive in. We are in the gospel according to Mark, and we are starting tonight with verse 21. If you're just starting with us, uh, this is our third week in the gospel according to Mark. Two things I want you to know. Uh, if this is your first time, Mark is the first and earliest gospel. So the other gospel writers, uh, Matthew, Luke, and probably John, uh, did have Luke's or have Mark's gospel at their disposal and they used some of his writings as they were writing their own. So that's the first thing I want you to remember. The second thing I want you to remember is that in Mark, Jesus is presented as the messianic secret. Jesus is presented as the strong man of light against darkness. And Jesus is presented as the suffering servant who had been prophesied to the nation of Israel through Isaiah the prophet. We're going to talk about some of that in just a minute. Let's dive in to Mark verse 21 of chapter 1. Tonight I'm in the New American Standard Bible, so if you have that version available to you, I uh, ask that you use it. If not, whatever version you have available, but just know the reading is probably going to be a little bit different, okay? So, uh, Jesus and his disciples uh, have uh, just um, walked away from the Sea of Galilee. Jesus is called to himself, uh, Simon and Andrew, as well as James and John. And here we find this. They went out to Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, 
he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately, the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. So we're going to stop at that first section, verses 21 to 39. Um, so here, what I want to look at, uh, first of all, is Jesus casting out uh, demons. Jesus casting out demons here. Uh, in these first few verses, uh, actually verses 21 to 28, Jesus casting out a demon, right? So as they walk with Jesus, the disciples witness Jesus doing three things. You'll see this throughout all of the Gospels, particularly throughout the Gospel of Mark. They see Jesus preaching, teaching, and healing the tripart or three-part ministry, uh, three-dimensional ministry of Jesus Christ. So any church uh, that is, is modeled after Jesus, any pastor, preacher, servant, uh, we have a preaching proclamation ministry, we have a teaching ministry, and we have a healing ministry. Those things overlap. They inform each other, but they are also distinct. So here's my first question for you tonight. What do you consider to be the difference between preaching and teaching, right? What is the difference between preaching and teaching? Because remember, when Jesus comes uh, out of the wilderness, <coughs> excuse me, the first thing he does is he begins to preach in Galilee, right? Remember that from earlier in chapter 1. Jesus uh, begins preaching uh, in Galilee, saying, the kingdom of God is here, is at hand. Repent and believe the good news or believe the gospel. So he's preaching there. But here in the text we're reading tonight, it says that Jesus and the disciples go to Capernaum and Jesus begins to teach in the synagogue. So here is my question to you. What is the difference for you between preaching and teaching? In addition to that, in what way do those two things nurture your spirit, right? How does preaching nurture your spirit? How does teaching nurture your spirit? Why is it that churches need to ensure that we have both ministries, both active and significant, right? Active, flourishing in the body of Christ, right? What is it about preaching? What is it about teaching that is important for us? So that's the first thing here. So Jesus goes to Capernaum. He begins to preach. He begins to teach. And he goes into the synagogue and his teaching is so powerful that they begin to murmur. They begin to talk to themselves once they see him uh, cast out this demon and once they hear the teaching that uh, he uh, performs in their midst. So I'm going to give you a few uh, thoughts on this particular passage. The first thing is that the teaching of Jesus uh, what we see in the passage is that the teaching of Jesus disrupts the dominion of darkness. Look at the text. The teaching of Jesus disrupts the dominion of darkness. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue, and in their presence is a man who is possessed with an unclean spirit. Uh, the unclean spirit uh, is a spirit that is opposed to Jesus. 
It is a spirit that is opposed to the kingdom of God that is at hand or has come near. The kingdom of Jesus is uh, opposed to this, to this unclean spirit, this morally impure spirit, right? And so what we find here is that this man uh, who is possessed with this unclean spirit, upon seeing Jesus and hearing his teaching, begins to speak out. He begins to disrupt uh, the service in the synagogue. Uh, Jesus can't teach uh, effectively because this man is now speaking out out of turn. And not only is he speaking out, he's doing so in a very violent and oppositional way. So what we know is that up until this point, this unclean spirit has had control over this particular man, right? So he walks around uh, with this spirit within him and this spirit takes control or takes over and causes him to act out in the synagogue. So the unclean spirit represents the kingdom of darkness while Jesus represents the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God who is at hand, right? Who has come near to the people of God. And so as Jesus begins to teach, uh, this dominion of darkness is being disturbed. Uh, this, this unclean spirit is unsettled, and he begins to speak out against Jesus, right? Hear the text. And it says that the unclean spirit then says, Jesus, what, what do we have to do with each other? Why are you here, Jesus of Nazareth? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God right? So this is something that's very interesting in the text, right? Because what we see here is that those around Jesus still don't yet understand who he is, right? They don't get it, but this unclean spirit recognizes Jesus. This unclean spirit recognizes who he is in his divinity, not just his humanity, right? So it's not just that he's Jesus of Nazareth, He's not just this, this preacher from Galilee who's shown up out of nowhere. No, the, the, the demon, the demonic spirit, the unclean spirit recognizes that Jesus is the Holy One of God. And he speaks out in fear and in opposition, saying, why are you here? Are you here because we have business with each other, right? So again, I want you to see how in this passage, right, Jesus is shown as what? The strong man, the strong man who is battling against forces of darkness and evil and those things that are unclean, right, in the world. So it says here, the unclean spirit recognizes Jesus, even though others are amazed and don't yet understand who Jesus is. They're amazed, but they really don't understand who Jesus is, not yet. Uh, isn't it amazing sometimes that those outside the body of Christ can affirm and identify and understand those who are walking according to the Spirit, but sometimes we who are in the body of Christ, those of us who know the Word, so we think, uh, who, who know church, but we sometimes are still unable to identify and affirm what God is doing in other people's lives, right? So we see here Jesus being the strong man. This is an exorcism, an exorcism. Some of you remember the 1970s film, The Exorcist, right? So it's not quite like that, but it is very similar. Notice the things we have in the text. When Jesus tells the unclean spirit to be quiet and come out of the man. Notice, notice this. Jesus rebukes him and he says, be quiet, come out of him. When the unclean spirit is called out, right? First thing we need to remember, we have to call out that which is evil and unclean and unrighteous in our midst. Time is out for being quiet about things. When we know something is wrong, uh, we shouldn't be intimidated by the loud barking of the unclean spirit, right? So the unclean spirit tries to intimidate Jesus by talking loud. Some of you remember the song, talking loud, saying nothing, right? So the unclean spirit talks loud, but Jesus is not intimidated. He rebukes the spirit and he calls the spirit out of the man. When it comes out, the man himself, right, who is the host, if you will, uh, for this unclean spirit, the man is thrown down 
he convulses and the unclean spirit cries out with a loud voice as he's coming out. This exorcism is painful. It is public, but it is also proof of Jesus's power, right? Remember, the strong man Jesus is stronger than the powers of darkness in the world. So this one passage reminds us or shows us in what way Jesus is stronger than the forces of darkness that are operating in the world. Now, how do we bring this home for where we are today in our world, especially this week when we've had such a wonderful thing happen? First of all, we need to be reminded that though we have turned the page on a horrendous period in our national history, though we've turned the page, we have a new president, a new vice president, we should not be so naive to think that evil has now been exorcised from our midst. We must still speak out. We must still refuse to be intimidated. We must still learn to identify evil in our midst and command it to come out, right? In many of our churches, many of our families, many of our communities, in our national government, there still needs to be an exorcism. And whenever an unclean spirit, whenever evil is called out and must leave, we see the convulsions, we see the loud, uh, painful process of evil being eradicated. Right. So we should not be surprised at some of the uprisings that are occurring by the by the the alt right, uh, by white supremacists, by those who are sympathizers of white supremacists, those who are racist and who support racist systems. They are like uh, this unclean. They are like those who are possessed by this unclean spirit. And as that unclean spirit is called out, as that unclean spirit is identified and stood up against and called out uh, to leave this nation, to leave our government, leave our families, leave our churches, what we find is the convulsions. We find sheer disruption, but the disruption that's being caused by the spirit of God is necessary. The convulsions are necessary for the exorcism to occur, right? So in a way, what we can see is that what's happening now, though it is painful, though it is public, it is also proof that the spirit of God truly is moving, that God is exorcising, cutting out uh, from the heart of this nation, I pray, the spirit, uh, the unclean spirit, that has been resting not only upon us, but in this nation, in the fabric, in the systems, in the customs, in the mores. Uh, and God is able, just as Jesus is able, as the strong man uh, who still lives for us uh, to exercise and to separate uh, the man, us, humanity, from the unclean spirit that has taken hold of us uh, and caused us to live in ways that are unrighteous. So that's what I have for you for that particular section, right? So Jesus shows up as the strong man, and Jesus is able to call out that spirit and cause it to come out. Uh, another thing I want you to notice uh, out of this passage is how Jesus speaks with such authority. Jesus speaks with tremendous authority, and it's that authority that makes them kind of take a second look at Jesus, right? They say, wait a minute. They're all amazed. What is this, right? Who is this man? Uh, first of all, he has not been to the rabbinical school of study in Jerusalem. Uh, this man is not connected to any of our rabbinic schools. Uh, this man is not one of the scribes. Uh, he is someone who's come from some backwater town. Uh, we know nothing good comes out of Nazareth. So what is this? Uh, who is this? What is going on? This is a new teaching and it's with authority, right? That's the thing that surprises them most, that Jesus is teaching with authority authority, right? With authority. What does it mean to have authority, right? Um, I've been a part of many organizations and I can tell you this, having a position is not the same thing as having authority, right? So you can have a position, <laughs> you can have a title, but still have no authority, 
right? So, so a title is simply a name, right? It's simply a name that identifies a, a role that is sort of an official title. So you have chancellors, you have presidents, you have um, in a church, you have uh, ministers, you have deacons, trustees, stewards, uh, ministry leaders, right? You have all these things in companies, you have CEOs, you have managers, you have directors. All of those things are titles, they're positions, but they don't necessarily mean you have the authority that comes with those titles, right? So here, uh, Jesus has no official title <laughs> in the neighborhood. He's just some dude who showed up, he got baptized, he went to the wilderness, now he's preaching, he's healing people. We don't know who he is. We know where he came from. None of this makes sense, but he has authority. <laughs> so this is something to remind us, you don't have to have a title to walk in authority. You don't have to have a title to walk and speak with authority. And notice this as well. Just because you have a title, just because you have a, 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 a position does not mean that you have authority, right? So in, in the flesh, we can bring this all the way down in the flesh. I want you to imagine that you are a, uh, let's say you are a manager, uh, at your at your place of business. You're a manager uh, in an office and you have that title, uh, but you can't make the decisions that you should be able to make as a manager because your director has to have uh, control of everything you're doing. You're micromanaged to the point that you're not really managing anything. You're just holding the place, right? Uh, so even though those who are serving under you, uh, those that you're responsible for uh, to grow and to manage and to oversee and to train, they even recognize that they don't need to even ask you anything because you can't make a decision. They go to the director, right? That is an example of someone who has a title but has no authority has no authority whatsoever. You just have some you just have a name plate on your desk, but everyone knows it's an empty role, right? But then you have other people. I want to use another example. Let's say that you're a part of a different kind of organization. Let's say you're a part of a board of directors. And even though you have a role as the let's say the chair uh, and there's certain things that the chair is responsible for, but the chair um, uh, has 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 no authority because there's someone else in the room who doesn't have uh, the chair role, but they really will the authority, right? They will the authority. It's what they say that influences everybody. So as the chair, you have to make sure that whatever you propose, that person is okay with, because if not, it's going to get knocked down every time, right? So what I'm trying to get you to understand is that is that having a title and having authority are two very, very different things. Two very different things. So don't confuse your position with your power, okay? Because authority is simply the power or the right to speak and to act a certain way, to make certain decisions, right? So if you don't have the power to do something, all you have is a title. You don't have the authority. What I love about Jesus here in the text, um, Jesus has no official title, right? Not, not in the flesh. He's just showed up on the scene. His ministry literally just started. He's the new Jack on the scene. And yet he is walking in his authority, his spiritual authority and the authority of his identity because he understands who he is. So I want to speak to someone right now. I want to encourage you not to worry so much about titles and positions. Learn to walk in the unique authority that you have as God's beloved creation. Learn to walk in the authority that you have as a blessed man or woman or child of God. Learn to walk and speak and decide things according to the authority that you have in the spirit. 
spirit, right? It's not so much about the title. It's about the power invested in us by Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit, right? So we have authority. We have spiritual authority. We can speak those things that be not as if they were, right? We have spiritual authority to call on the name of God and know that God hears us. We have authority. Authority. Jesus said, if you believe with the size of faith, the size of a mustard seed, you can speak to this mountain and it has to move. So we have authority, right? We may not have a title. You may not be a deacon or a minister. Or you may not be a bishop. You may not be a pastor, uh, but you have authority if you are a part of the family of God. Just like Jesus, we can speak and we can walk in our authority and people will be amazed like who is she where she come from who is he who gave him the right to walk and speak in this way but we understand that our power comes from above so applicable to what we find going on in our nation today when we try to seize power on our own in our flesh according to our will by our networks through our scheming and our manipulation the <laughs> we we can count on one thing that the same way we had to scheme and manipulate to stay on top eventually when those cookies crumble right when the house of cards falls down those who have been crowned with righteousness, those who seek truly to do the right thing will surely rise to the top. Because remember, we can't seize spiritual authority. That authority is vested in us by Christ. God imputes God's righteousness to us. And that is the righteousness that gives us authority to speak and act and, and decide and do uh, according to the will of God. All right, so that's the first section I want us to, to look at today. All right, so this, the, the next section that we're going to look at, verses 29 to 31, verses 29 to 31, let's take a look at it. Again, we're in the New American Standard Bible, the New American Standard Bible. Let's hear what the Word of God says. And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew, with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her and he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand and the fever left her and she waited on him. Interesting passage. First of all, what I want you to note is how the text shifts from a public healing to a private healing, right? So you have these two things in juxtaposition, right? Something that happens publicly in the synagogue. You have many people who are there to witness this. But then you go into someone's house, right, for a private, a private healing experience, okay? There's something to note. Something else to note, that Jesus now... Um, in this particular case, uh, the first healing was very dramatic, right? It seemed very significant, important, big. I mean, you're talking about uh, being possessed of an unclean spirit, right? So we would call that uh, an emergency situation, right? This is urgent. This, this is big. Well, he comes home and Peter's mother-in-law has a fever. Mm, doesn't seem so big, right? More mundane, run-of-the-mill. And yet Jesus is concerned about both, right? Another juxtaposition, public versus private, uh, what we would consider to be significant versus very small in our eyes, but both are important to Jesus, okay? Here are these things I want us to note here, right? So the episode stands in contrast to the first one. Um, the one I want us to see about the public-private and the, 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 the big, small, significant small, is that we need to understand that no problem we face, no issue about which we are concerned, uh, no um, pain that we experience is too small or insignificant to the Lord. God is concerned about everything that happens in our lives everything. 
everything from a headache to demon possession. God's concerned about it. And God is willing to heal us of it. That's really, really important, really significant, right? When Jesus uh, touches her, right, of this, of this what we call mundane run-of-the-mill ailment, uh, this is an indication that God is concerned about the minutia of our lives. Sometimes some of us don't pray about things because we really think, well, I don't want to bother God with that. I mean, that's so small, but it's bothering you. It has you off your game. You're losing sleep over it. You can't function optimally because of it. And if it's something that is depleting your energy, something that's depleting your ability to think, something that is interfering in your ability to flourish, God is concerned about it because God is about flourishing. And if your life isn't flourishing, God is concerned about why. So that's one of the reasons I love this really, really short episode in the life of Jesus is because it teaches us that God truly is concerned about everything that goes on in our lives. There is nothing too big and there's nothing too small for our God, right? So that's an amazing thing for us to remember. Nothing too big, nothing too small. Out of this passage, I also want to uh, highlight something else. At the end of the passage, it says, Jesus came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand. The fever left, and she waited on him. I got two things I want to say about this, right? First of all, Jesus raised her up. Uh, this, this raising of the mother-in-law, who's lying down, sick because she has a fever, uh, she's alive, but it kind of foreshadows the power that Jesus has over things that are dead or dying, right? Now, she's not literally dying here. It's just a foreshadowing. It's it's a hint of the kind of power that Jesus has, right? So there's this woman laying prostrate. She can't get up. Uh, she's really bothered by this fear or this fever, and Jesus shows up. And he takes her by the hand and he raises her up, right? The image of bringing life back into this body. In this way, it foreshadows the life-changing transformation power that God has in Jesus to raise life from the dead. Right. So it's just kind of a hint, kind of a foreshadowing, just just a little bit to, to, to tease our imagination about how Jesus is going to operate as the strong man who brings life from the dead. Right. It foreshadows his entire mission and ministry because Jesus is here in order to bring life. Right. So just as she was lying down, suffering of a fever and Jesus raised her up by touching her hand later at the end of the right at the end of the story, which we know now. But again, the original readers or hearers didn't know this. Right. We know the end of the story is that when Jesus is laying down truly dead because he had been truly crucified, the Holy Spirit will come and raise Jesus from the dead, right? So it's a little bit of foreshadowing, kind of a literary device that I think is kind of cool in this, in this particular part of the passage. In addition to that, last thing, notice her response after Jesus attends to her need, right? What does she do? She gets up and she waited on them, waited, served Right. So when Jesus attends to her need, her response is to serve them. Right. Her response is to serve. Here's my question for us. Here's my question. I have two. How do you respond when Jesus finally does answer a prayer and raises you up? Whatever it is. 
raises you up out of depression, raises you up out of anxiety, raises you up out of a financial crisis, raises you up out of a destructive, toxic relationship, raises you up uh, into a new position uh, where you're making more money, you have more power, more authority, better title. Uh, when he raises you up and gives you the children you've been praying for, whatever it is, right? How do you respond for real, right? You don't have to be churchy, but put it in the comments. Uh, how do we respond? Do we always get up and serve God for real? Or do we sometimes get up and we just go on about our business, right? We get up and we're just like, remember at, at another point in, in the gospel story, Jesus meets 10 lepers and those lepers uh, cry out to Jesus uh, to, to help them. And Jesus says, go show yourself to the priests. And as they are going, they realize that they are being healed. And so because of that, one of them goes back and says, oh, thank you, Jesus. I can't believe it. I appreciate you so much. I've been separated from my family. I can't believe that I'm being healed right now just by your voice. You didn't have to touch me. You didn't do anything. But but I just I just appreciate you. Thank you so much. And Jesus, Jesus says, wait, there were 10 of you all. Where are the nine? There were 10. Now, I healed 10, but one came back to thank me, right, to serve, to thank me, give me praise, give me glory. Where are the nine? Where are the rest of them? They've gone on about their business. They go in to show the priest, and then they're going to go home to their families. They're going to go back and get their jobs or whatever else they were doing, right? They're going to go back to their regular life. The, the, the point I'm trying to make is that when, when God raises us up through the power of the living Christ, uh, the proper response is to deepen the relationship through service, through praise, through prayer, uh, through worship, uh, through serving others, raising others up, right? Serving, waiting on, serving God in the way that we are uniquely created to serve God. But it is too often that we use the 911 spiritual hotline. Jesus, uh, get me out of this. Uh, we use the 911 spiritual call service. Uh, I need help and I need it right now. And God sends it and, and maybe not even on purpose. We just start going on about our way. We were praying every day when we had a problem. But when the problem is over, we start praying every other day. Then it's every four days. Then it's once a week. Then it's only when we go to church, right? So we need to be careful. We just need to be careful that as God raises us up, that God raises us up. Jesus, by God, by his power, raises us up to do a great work in the world. Not so we can go back to our old lives and forget about the great things that God has done for us and to us, right? So that's my first question. What do you do when God finally does show up? What do you do when Jesus finally does raise you up out of that circumstance? The second question is how has Jesus raised you up? How has Jesus raised you up? Now, again, put it in the comments, right? In what ways can you testify? You know Jesus has raised you up because you can see that you are not in that situation anymore. How has Jesus raised you up, right? Another question for reflection as we go through these passages together. In the next section of the, of the, uh, of the chapter, 32 through 39, what we find is that Jesus performs uh, many, many healings, right? Remember, up until now, all of this is the same day. It's the same day. Jesus goes to the synagogue. Uh, as soon as he hits town, he goes to the, the synagogue. He starts teaching. He performs an exorcism. As soon as they get out of the synagogue, he goes to the house and Simon's mother-in-law sick, and he heals her. And then when evening comes, same day, right? Same day. It says, when the evening came, after the sun had set, they, assuming that these are townspeople, um, began bringing to him, Jesus, all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door. You hear that? The whole city. 
And he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. He said to them, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. What I want to get at here is that as soon as the Sabbath ended, right? Because this is the Sabbath day, they're in synagogue, and on the Sabbath day, you're not supposed to do any work, right? This includes carrying sick people on their pallets, right? Nothing that exerts energy. Not supposed to do that on the Sabbath. So they wait till the sun goes down because Sabbath is from sundown to sundown, right? So Sabbath, as soon as the sun goes down, they said, bam, the sun goes down, get this pallet. We're going to see Jesus. So everybody in town gets their sick. They take their shut in. They get their demon-possessed cousins and mamas and daddies and aunts aunties and uncles and neighbors and they all flood the street and they're all outside of uh simon and andrew's house all of them just the whole town right that's what it says the whole city's at the door all these sick people demon possessed people right and so jesus has to keep working you know because there's people are out there and they're expecting a miracle just like when we flood the Congress, when we used to flood the sanctuary, we're looking for a miracle. I'm looking for a miracle. Um, and they came looking for a miracle because they had heard by then about what Jesus had done um, in the synagogue. Word had got all over town about how he cast out that demon, how he taught with such authority, right? And now, you know, maybe they knew Peter's mother-in-law had been sick. She had that fever and look at her now. She's baking cakes and she's over there making lemonade for everybody to drink, right? So she's up, she's doing good and everybody's looking for a miracle. And so Jesus being Jesus with a heart of compassion, he heals many of them. He heals them. He casts out these demons. He's working all day long. He's working, right? Remember, what did I tell you? Jesus is, is, is noted as a strong man. We see that, right? Battling, casting out demons, eradicating disease, being stronger than those things that are trying to defeat us. Also, the messianic secret. Notice in the first thing, in the synagogue, he tells that demon to, to be quiet and come out. Here in the latter part of this section that we're talking about tonight, we see that when the demons come out, it says that he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was, right? So Jesus is somehow in the Gospel of Mark trying to keep his true identity kind of like under wraps. He's not trying to bring attention to himself. He just wants to heal people and go on about his business. That's what it looks like. He just wants to preach and teach. He's not trying to draw the negative attention from the temple, right? From Jerusalem. He's not, he's not into that. He just wants people to be well. And he's telling them, don't say anything, right? Don't say anything. And so we have this messianic secret, Jesus in the house and people are coming to the house. Jesus is kind of, kind of separated in that way. Uh, he's not into the title, right? In that way, he doesn't self-identify that way. We don't hear Jesus saying who he is. He's just doing the work, right? Another thing we see in the text, and this is what I preached on on this past Sunday, so some of you are aware of that. Um, this passage 35 to 39, uh, early in the morning after a tremendous day of ministry, what does Jesus do? He goes to a secluded place to rest and to pray. To hear from God, to commune with God the Father, hear from God the Father, recharge, regenerate, uh, refocus, 
realign his thinking, make sure he gets the power, the perspective that he needs in order to continue to live out his purpose, right? Again, I want to encourage all of us who are in this work of healing, who are in this work of, of attending to the needs of other people, whether they're your children, your spouse, your parents, um, if you're a nurse, if they're patients, whatever, make sure you steal away to recharge and to get the restoration that you need so that you can do this uh, for the long term, right? We, if we're not well, we can't truly be our best to help others to find their way toward wellness, okay? You want to remember that. Want to do this last section for you, then we're going to get out of here. Um, starting at verse 40 to 45, the last section of chapter 1 in Mark. A leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him, saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed and he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news. Start spreading the news, right? Start spreading the news all around town to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city. So he stayed in unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. All right. What do we see here? This last section, Jesus cleanses a leper. So we have Jesus, the strong man. Jesus tells this man, uh, this man who is stricken with leprosy, right? So let me not say a leper because his identity uh, should not be bound up with his sickness. So um, forgive me for that. Let me change that. Jesus heals a man stricken with leprosy, right? And when he heals this man of his leprosy, Jesus shows once again that he is the strong man, right? Um, he tells this man to be quiet. Go do what we are told to do in the law of Moses, right? You need to go. There's this whole ritual about being confirmed to being cleansed of leprosy. So I want you to go through the ritual, right? So that they can pronounce you cleansed according to the law. And then I want you to go on your merry way. But this man, messianic secret, but this man is too excited. So he goes and he tells everybody. And that really shifts the narrative so that Jesus can't go around publicly anymore. Right? People have to come to him because every time he shows up somewhere, he's swamped. Right? What do I want us to know from this particular passage? Well, the first thing I, I note is that the man stricken with leprosy approached Jesus with humility in his speech and in his action. First of all, in his speech, uh, let's look at first um, uh, in, his, in his action, right? It says he fell on his knees before Jesus, right? Putting himself physically lower than him, right? He's on the ground kneeling before Jesus, right? So in a posture of pleading, in a posture of poverty, in a posture of humility, acknowledging that, that you are greater than I am, that you have something to give and I have something and, and I need to receive, uh, saying you are somehow um, uh, uh, more able and I am less able. You are stronger and I am weaker, right? So, so just their positioning in terms of their physical um, relationship. Uh, in relation to uh, their physical proximity to each other and how they are arranged says something about uh, who has authority 
and who does not, who has power, who does not, who has strength, who does not, who has resources, who does not. So whenever you go somewhere, I want you to pay attention to how people are arranged, right? So whenever you have um, a people around you or if you go to an event and there are people on the platform, right? Those who are on the platform, for those moments, they're considered more important, right? Which is why some people love to be on the platform. Uh, me, I could sit on the floor. Uh, I don't necessarily want to be on the platform, but I'm often up there. Um, right? I, I, I usually don't want to be on the platform, uh, but I'm up there, right? But the platform it indica it's not just so people can see who you are, but it is also a recognition that at least for this event, there's a rank of importance, right? So this man comes to Jesus, lays prostrate, and identifies that in this, in this moment, Jesus has something he needs, and he's acknowledging that. He's acknowledging the greatness of Jesus, the power of Jesus, by falling on his knees. Next thing that we see here, is that in his speech, in what he says, he also shows humility in how he relates to Jesus. How does he do that? First of all, right, he uses the word, Mark uses the word beseeching him, right? The word beseech means to beg, to beg. So if you ever say, I beseech you, <laughs> Uh, those of us who know the King James Version, right? So in, I think it's Romans uh, chapter 12, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, right? I beseech you, I beg you. It means to beg. It means to plead. Uh, it is not a posture, <laughs> it is not a word, it is not something that those in power tend to do, right? Uh, it's not very often that you have people who are in power who, who beseech others, who beg others for anything. Uh, those who beg, who beseech, who plead are those who understand the poverty um, of their relative position. Those who understand that they uh, don't have what they need to meet the need that is, in, that is in front of them, to overcome the obstacle that they are facing. And so they're willing to set their pride aside in order to get what they need, right? So this, so this man who is stricken with leprosy um, begs Jesus that if, if you're willing to, I know you can make me clean. Notice this, the man doesn't say, if you are able, please cleanse me of my leprosy. Because look, the word is out. The word is out. He can, he can cast out demons. Uh, he can heal you from all kinds of disease, from a fever to anything else, right? People from all around town, uh, all around Galilee, all around Capernaum, right? It says at the end of, of, of the last section, he went into their synagogues throughout all of Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. So, so this, this man stricken with leprosy, he has heard about what Jesus has done for others. And so he believes that I am no different from anybody else. And that if Jesus could do that for them, I know he could do it for me too. So he falls down and he says, look. Um, I'm begging you, Lord. I, I, I am pleading with you. If you are willing, I know you can cleanse me. So this man approaches uh, Jesus, recognizing Jesus' authority, recognizing his power. Uh, though he still doesn't really have a title, he understands who Jesus is, what Jesus is able to do. And so by doing that, the leper breaks the social code of the time. He breaks the religious code of the time. He is supposed to be isolated somewhere, right? When you have leprosy, which is a highly contagious disease of the skin, um, you are considered unclean. And if you are out in public, you're supposed to be wrapped up. None of your skin is supposed to show. And you're supposed to scream out, unclean, unclean so that people around you can get away from you, right? So that they won't catch it, 
right? Because it's very contagious. Uh, so to avoid that, you're really supposed to be at home somewhere. Um, this is why they had what they call leper colonies for people who contract this deadly disease or this people who contract this communicable disease can live together because they're all infected, right? So the leper is breaking all kinds of codes and rules uh, and customs, right? Uh, he should be isolated from the public. He should be crying out um, to let people know that he's ill uh, because this sickness has created for him several barriers. Uh, it's created a religious barrier. Uh, he can only go so far in the, in the temple court, right? If he goes to Jerusalem, if he were to get there, he can only go so far in the temple court. He can't even get as close as the women can get in the temple court, right? Because he uh, has been stricken with this disease. So it separates him religiously. Uh, it separates him from society. He can't be around people. And it, it impacts him economically. This is to say that we, we, we need to understand how sickness um, impacts the lives of others, right? So sickness is not just that sickness impacts the body. Sickness impacts uh, our how we're treated by the church. It impacts our religious re life. It impacts our relationships and it impacts our economics, which is why it is a, a sin and a shame the way that our nation often treats those who are sick by penalizing people who had preconditioned, pre-existing conditions, by penalizing people, by uh, having these extravagant costs for medicine so that pharmacists uh, pharmaceutical companies and their CEOs can make billions, uh, even though these people need these medicines to save their lives, right? Um, so that's a shame. That tells us where our values are. Uh, so this man is impacted in many ways, which is why Jesus' compassion for him is so amazing, right? The word compassion means uh, with passion. C-O-M, that come means with, and passion means suffering, so with suffering, to suffer with. So Jesus suffers with this man. It says, move with compassion. Jesus is moved. He suffers with this man. He feels this man's pain. He experiences it, uh, the ultimate impact, if you will. Jesus is moved in his, in his bowels, in his gut. He, he feels the weight of this man's condition. And so Jesus doesn't just speak to him. Jesus touches this man, again, breaking the religious code of the time, the religious law. You're not supposed to touch a person who has leprosy because then you're unclean. So now you have to go, you have to go uh, just like he does into, into a colony created for people with this disease. But look at what Jesus does. When Jesus touches the leper or the man with leprosy, excuse me, when Jesus touches this man with leprosy, a, a, a dramatic transformation takes place. Jesus, who is healing, transfers his healing uh, into, the lep into the man with leprosy's life, right? Jesus's healing is transferred, is imputed into this man's life, and he is healed. He is cleansed. And the leprosy then is taken on by Jesus, right? Jesus takes the leprosy and gives this man healing. But because Jesus is healing, the leprosy can't affect him. That's good to me. I don't know. That, that didn't do anything for you all. That, that did it for me. Because Jesus is healing, the leprosy cannot infect Jesus, right? So Jesus touches this man, and the man is healed. Leprosy is gone, so he can experience restoration. The touch of Jesus truly does restore. The touch of Jesus truly does restore. I want you to, to note that in your notes. The touch of Jesus really does restore. It can restore us in our relationship with God. This man who has leprosy is now, uh, if he goes... <laughs> And shows himself to the priests and they can pronounce him, according to the law, cleansed. 
now he can go into the temple and worship according to their custom. He can be reunited with his family, his friends. He can go and he can work, he can earn a living. He can contribute to society. He can help others. He can be restored all because Jesus was willing to take from him the burden of this sickness and impute into his life, send into his life, transfer into his life um, healing and wholeness so that he can experience truth transformation. Well, that's what we're about here at TFCC, helping others to find true transformation in their relationship with God, real people experiencing real change. Just like this leper, uh, you find yourself separated from God, separated from, from people, separated uh, from, from financial success. Uh, you find yourself on the underside of life, um, lying down as if dead, stricken as if by a fever that has, that has a cloud over your life. I am here to tell you tonight that there is hope there is healing. There is restoration. It is possible in Christ. I hope you've enjoyed our uh, time together tonight. I definitely have uh, as we walk with Jesus through Mark chapter 1. Uh, again, put some comments in the comment section. I want to know what you think. Uh, I want to know what you've learned tonight. Let's continue to learn and grow together as we move forward in our relationship with God. Look, I look forward to seeing you on Sunday, 9 a.m., Facebook and YouTube. Until then, my friends, be well, be blessed, and be transformed. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you Sunday. Take care. Bye-bye.